Okay, welcome everyone to a another random walk down Mill Street. Uh, tonight's topic is the 19th Street Synagogue. Uh, and the reason that we are talking about the 19th Street Synagogue is that uh, this Shabbat, Parashat Nitzavim, Nitzavim Bayelech this year, uh, is the consecration anniversary of the 19th Street Synagogue. I don't know how many of you uh, are familiar with that synagogue. It existed for a relatively short period of time from 1860 to 1897. 1860 to 1897. Not the longest of our buildings, uh, but one of the most interesting and grand uh, synagogues that our congregation has occupied. And one of the more interesting synagogues in New York City during its life. Uh, and so I figured, you know, Dr. Poole, of blessed memory, has a booklet about the Mill Street Synagogue, which encompasses the first Mill Street Synagogue from 1730, the second Mill Street Synagogue of 1818. He has a booklet about the, um, the Crosby Street Synagogue, which was built in 1834. Uh, but he has, and he has a booklet about the 70th Street Synagogue, the current building. But he has no uh, booklet, no monograph about the 19th Street Synagogue. So I have a feeling that uh, people are a little bit less familiar with this synagogue than the other ones, except for maybe the picture of its facade, which a lot of people have seen on our website or elsewhere. Whenever people mention the 19th Street Synagogue, there is one picture that they use, and we're going to see it shortly. Um, but I, I had a feeling that not too many people know about the 19th Street Synagogue. And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And there's no great mystery that we're going to reveal. There's not going to be any aha moment. But uh, I it is a little bit like show and tell. I'm going to show you uh, some items uh, from the synagogue, uh, from our archives in particular. Uh, we're going to look at some photographs that are uh, not well known. And uh, maybe we'll talk about them a little bit, or maybe we'll just ooh and ah and that'll be the evening. Okay, I'm going to share my screen now with uh, my PowerPoint. If I can get to it. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Uh, let me try to move some of these things off of the, sc the screen here. Okay, you should see oh, what is happening here. Okay, sorry about that. You should see uh, on your screen my PowerPoint. A random walk down Mill Street, the 19th Street Synagogue, a building of unusual interest. That's the title for tonight. You'll see why shortly. Um, and my PowerPoint is not reacting very well. Okay. Starting off with uh, a little, uh, just there's a little Chazan's booklet, that uh, handwritten uh, order of prayers for a special Shabbatot. Uh, I think it was written, doesn't have a name in the beginning, but I think it was written by Chazan Wachnon in the 1930s. And it says, for Shabbat Nitzavim, or Vat Nitzavim Vayelech, uh, is the anniversary of the consecration of the 19th Street Synagogue. That is this Shabbat. And it has a special service, as I think we've talked about on different occasions, Shabbat Agadol, Seventh Day of Passover, after the Shachrit, um, we sing Lam bin Ginot, and then there's a special prayer for the government, and the choir sings Tehillat Adonai, and the Kamish Beirach, and the choir sings Va'anachnu, we have special Hashkabot, and that's the uh, consecration service. What's not written here, uh, but also part of it, is we sing Todot El to introduce the Nishmat Kolchai, and the Heichal remains open during most of the service uh, with its colored cloak, so it's that these days are given special festive um, customs to make them special, special melodies, special uh, uh, visual reminders of the specialness of the day. 
And what is it that we're commemorating is the building of this synagogue, the opening of this synagogue that you see on the right, which is the 19th Street Synagogue, which is located at 5 West 19th Street, just west of 5th Avenue, uh, and was a uh, pretty grand synagogue, as you can just see from the picture here. Uh, it was demolished in 1898, uh, so you cannot go there and see it anymore. Uh, but we'll talk about what you can see uh, by the end of this uh, um, uh, session. Okay, um, the title of the of the uh, class tonight or uh, the presentation tonight uh, came from a sentence in the Jewish Encyclopedia. Um, you will not find an entry about the 19th Street Synagogue. You will not find it in the uh, in any discussion of it in the uh, entry on Sherath Israel, which is quite significant. You won't even really find any or barely any mention of it in the long article about New York. But interestingly enough, you will find an entire paragraph about the 19th Street Synagogue in the entry for America. As if that weren't a large enough topic to get a whole paragraph about one synagogue but it exists, and that's because a part of the of the entry about America was written by none other than A. W. Brunner. That's Arnold Brunner. That is the architect who created, who built, uh, who um, designed our current synagogue, and was a notable Jewish architect of uh, of that era, the late nineteenth and early twentieth centuries. And he has a um, he so he has a whole thing about architecture, Jewish architecture. And one paragraph is devoted to our the synagogue that we're talking about this evening. So we'll read it. The Congregation Sheriff Israel, New York, owners of the original building in Mill Street, referred to above, which we don't have to talk about today, built in 1860 a synagogue on strictly classic lines on West 19th Street. The facade was ornamented by two orders, Ionic below and Corinthian above. And the edifice was crowned by an octagonal dome. The building, now demolished, was of unusual interest. That's where our title came from. The main entrance was on its south side. The entire ground floor was therefore devoted to vestibules and staircases in order that the entrance to the synagogue proper should be at its western end and the ark placed at the east. If you are confused, I will explain shortly. The general effect of the interior was very imposing, the dome ceiling being of a great height and the arc well proportioned. The Corinthian columns supported the galleries and pilasters, cornices and balustrades were used. The windows were arched with keystones and classic forms were consistently employed. That is the description in the Jewish Encyclopedia, which I think is 1902 of the 19th Street Synagogue, 19th Street Synagogue built in 1860. Um, that was, that description was being written at a time when the synagogue was no longer extant, although it hadn't been demolished for a lot, very long. So the uh, author, Brunner, had actually seen the synagogue. Um, but uh, there is a earlier description in a guidebook, a New York City guidebook, King's Handbook of New York which is, uh, was published in the 1890s, I think 1892 or 1893. And it's kind of um, a uh, cute uh, description, which I thought I would read to you as well. Uh, and, and looking at the picture at the same time, you can sort of understand more about its significance or its features. The Temple Sheriff Israel in West 19th Street, close to Fifth Avenue, is one of those structures of unfamiliar appearance which makes New York cosmopolitan in architecture. So this is the guidebook to New York City in 1892, saying here's a site that makes New York City special. An unusual building on West 19th Street, the Temple Synagogue, Sheriff Israel. The front presents the appearance of two very high stories. And by that, I mean, think he means this and this. Um, each with its capital supported by double columns. Capital supported by columns. Capital supported by columns. The entrance is broad and high, and the windows are capped in semicircular arches. The temple is surmounted by a Moorish dome, which is prominent for a considerable distance. The temple sheriff Israel looms high over the houses of West 19th Street, which is with its classic front 
and ponderous dome. Okay, that's really all I needed to read. But here you take a look at the picture of it. Uh, in in uh, this is these are two different pictures, but you can get a good sense of uh, of what it was talking about. That is the 19th Street Synagogue, and it was high, high uh, up uh, on the. Uh, let's see if this will come up. Okay, uh, on it, it was a high building. There weren't that many tall buildings in 1860. Certainly not north of uh, 14th Street, and it is said, at least Dr. Poole says it without attribution, that it was the tallest building. Uh, north of 14th Street in New York City when it was built. So it was a very high and could be seen for a long ways off um, building. Uh, in our archives are a few things that are of interest. One is this, um, I don't even know what to call it exactly, silver plate or metallic uh, page. Uh, I, I probably is a better word for it. Um, which was dedic a dedicatory page about the construction of the laying of the foundation of the 1860s syn uh, synagogue, which was placed in its um, cornerstone, along with several other items. This was actually opened up uh, not that many years ago, with probably about 20 or 30 years ago, uh, and I think my mother was involved in the opening of that cornerstone. And this was one of the items taken out of the cornerstone. And it uh, has a little nice Hebrew dedication. Tikatev zot ledor acharon ha'even hazot. Let's see if I can read it here. Bacheru habotim lerosh pina liached beit hakneset liased to to the the foundation of the beit hakneset ki lachdosh asher et Yisrael biyom bet on the on Monday. Um, Tevet, I guess maybe it's or well, you know it's, uh, the ninth of Tammuz Shnat Beit Yisrael Baruchu et Hashem. That's the and they have the year eighteen. It's I think it's eighteen fifty eight or eighteen fifty nine. They laid the foundation stone um, uh, for the building of this synagogue, and it has the names of the officers: Jacob Satius, who we have a picture of right here. Asher Kershit, who have a little bit of a fainter picture over here. Asher Kershit was the uh, prime mover in the purchase and building of this synagogue, which was purchased at great expense and for which the synagogue had to take out a mortgage in order to pay for. Uh, and so he is the prime mover and mainly responsible for this building of the 1860 synagogue. And some of the other members of the board, as well as the minister, Jacques Jude Lyons, and the lecturer, uh, Arnold Fischel, um, and the architect, Robert Mook. We'll talk a little bit about um, Mook in a, in a minute. Um, here, if I didn't skip a um, uh, slide, is a description of the dedication a year, about a year later, a little more than a year later. We have the dedication of the synagogue, and it's a, a pretty long description, which I'm going to read through uh, hopefully quickly. But there are certain elements in here which I think are are, are really important to, uh, to 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 get a sense of the size and impressiveness of the building, as well as the interior. Um, and so this is a news report from September 28th, 1860, from the American Israelite, Jewish newspaper of the day. Dedication of the New York of the new synagogue of the Portuguese Congregation Sheriff Israel. By the way, this is a reform. Um, leaning um, uh, newspaper, the uh, orthodox leaning or the observant leaning newspaper was the Occident. This one is a little bit more reform, um, which you can see, which we will see a little bit later on in the in the text. Okay. Uh, the dedication of the new synagogue of the Portuguese congregation Jareth Israel. It is with utmost feelings of pleasure that I lay before the numerous readers of the Israelite a sketch of the ceremony of the consecrating of the new synagogue of the Portuguese congregation of this city. Knowing that an account of the event would be welcome to our brethren throughout the country, although outside of New York. Meaning, assuming if you're in New York, you heard about it, but if you weren't, here's, a, here's something that I want to share with you. Thinking it appropriate at the same time to give a short description and history of the building, I will make the commencement with these. The congregation Sheriff Israel is considered to be the oldest congregation at present in existence in the United States. 
dating its organization from the year 1727 and counts among its members descendants from Israelites who not only took part in the revolutionary struggles of the colonies, but who may be counted among the first settlers of the country. The congregation worked with at various parts of the lower, lower Manhattan until 1834, when the edifice in Crosby Street, in which the congregation have worshipped up to a short time ago, and from which they have just removed, was erected. About 18 months ago, the trustees found themselves compelled to respond to the uptown movement, then and still pervading the people of the metropolis. People are no longer living downtown. They're no longer living in what we now call the village. They're moving further and further up. And this compels the trustees to respond and purchased a beautiful site in the most fashionable and most aristocratic part of the city. Finding ready purchasers for their old synagogue, immediate steps were taken to erect the new edifice with the shortest possible delay. Although at the time of the sale, it was agreed that the congregation could occupy the building until a fixed period. Still, this period had come on before the new building. So they sold the old building. They they uh, bought the new building. They thought their building would, the new building would be completed, but it wasn't. And consequently, the congregation had to occupy other premises. The trustees therefore rented a spacious hall at 894 Broadway, which I think is around 14th Street. And here the congregation met to the present time in 1860. The new building is situated on West 19th Street, one door from Fifth Avenue. So it's not the on Fifth Avenue, it's one building off of Fifth Avenue. It is built in the most elegant style. The building has a Dorchester tr uh, free stone front. The dimensions of the lot are 72 by 92. The dimensions of the building on the inside are 70 by 82. It has seats for 800 persons but can hold a great many more if required. It is well lighted and very airy, being high and spacious. The main floor is reached by a flight of stairs. A separate flight leads to the ladies' galleries, of which there are two. So there are two ladies' galleries. An immense dome containing 600 gas lights rises in the center of the building, contributing a great deal to the lighting of the building. The seats on the main floor are arranged on both sides, north and south, the entrance being on the west. So what we mentioned briefly earlier, and um, which I will explain now, um, the entrance to the building was on the north side of 19th Street. So if you're on 19th Street, the orientation of the street is is uh, west to east or east-west. you know east -west. And so the entrance facing north, uh, is is going is 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 facing north. So if you were to build a synagogue that way, and you wanted to walk into the synagogue, if you were walking in the back of the synagogue from the street, that would mean that the synagogue was facing north. We didn't want to do that. Charlottesville didn't want to do that. They wanted it to face east, the most traditional orientation for a synagogue. And so they spent an entire floor. The whole front floor is just rooms and vestibules, so that people could go up the steps and enter from the back so that the whole floor was oriented uh, west to east and facing east where it was uh, um, on the second floor where the main sanctuary was. So that's what it said earlier, that you come in, go up the steps, come in from the back of the synagogue so that, that you entered not in the back of the synagogue. You entered in, a, in, a, in an entranceway, and then you had to walk all the way around in order to come into the synagogue from the back facing east. Okay, I don't know if that was any but better good explanation or not, but there you have it. Um, the reader's desk, which faces east, where the ark is, and also the preacher's pulpit facing the congregation, are in the middle, and not as in German synagogues at the head of the floor. The Aron Kodesh is supported. And now I have to minimize this little thing here that keeps getting in my way. The Aron Kodesh is supported by four marble pillars of the most beautiful kind, at the head of which stand the Ten Commandments on two slabs of marble. The doors of the Aron Kodesh are of rosewood and are carved in the most beautiful style. The whole of the front is covered with a beautiful set satin damask curtains which fall over it. In front of the ark hangs the perpetual lamp, 
which is of massive silver and which hangs on silver chains. A relic of remarkable interest is a small piece of stone from the wall of the temple at Jerusalem, which I can only imagine means the Western Wall, brought by Mr. Mendes Kersheet and placed in a column supporting one of the pillars of the Oran HaKodesh. Two slabs erected by the trustees to the memory of Abraham Turo and Washington Hendricks, whose munificence to the congregation and charities attached to it will be remembered by the congregation, must arrest the eye of the casual observer as he passes up both sides of the stairs leading to the main floor. A fact which is to be greatly regretted is that the congregation has neither choir nor organ attached to it, although at the dedication, a beautiful band of music and several of the best singers in the city were engaged. So as of 1860, the congregation did not have a choir, but they had a choir for this ceremony. The ground floor is used for the minister and the rabbi to robe themselves as well as for congregational purposes. The ground and the building cost the sum of $100,000, and can therefore be considered the most costly edifice for devotional purposes among Israelites in the country. That is a um, description of the dedication of the 19th Street Synagogue. So there's a couple interesting things about that. Uh, one is that, um, or really the thing that really struck me was that there is a piece of the Western Wall embedded in the pillar of the uh, by the Heichal. I have never seen mention of that anywhere else. Dr. Poole, nobody mentions it. Requires more research. But that is pretty amazing. Uh, and then that the dome which we mentioned earlier that's in the top and the center has 600 flames lighting it. Which uh, I think I might have a quote from another article a little later which we'll read uh, which is quite interesting as well. But that is how uh, the synagogue was lit. They had lamps, uh, of course, but the main lighting for the synagogue came from gas lamps or gas flames that were illuminating the dome in the center. Okay, now we'll go back, take a look at some more pictures and descriptions. Um, in the archives is also a uh, a printed booklet which they had uh, made it's actually this doesn't give it a good this is almost like a full page almost eight and a half by eleven i don't know the exact size of it but it's a pretty uh, hefty uh, uh little booklet for the dedication of the synagogue and here is actually uh an image of the dedication ceremony as it was published in frank leslie's illustrated newspaper september 1860 and you can get a sense of some of what it's talking about so there is a dome up here which you can't really see uh, there is a ladies' gallery, men's section. The uh, We're facing east. You have this very grand uh, wall, and you have pillars, one of which has some piece of the western wall in it, an arc with a canopy above it with some silk uh, textile hanging down. The Ten Commandments are here, um, and we'll see more pictures of it as well. This uh, picture cannot possibly considered be considered um, the most accurate uh, because it has no uh, pews anywhere in this picture. All these people here are just standing around. Everyone's standing around. There's no pews in this uh, illustration, and there's no pulpit. And there was a mention of a pulpit uh, made. So this picture has to be taken with a little bit of a grain of salt. Still, it's a pretty good um sense of the dedication ceremonies and you get to see you see how grand it was with all the Sifri Torah coming and the Chazanim marching behind uh that's a it's a nice nice little thing better yet is the description that they have on the next page which uh I'll try to read through quickly at some uh, I don't need to spend too much time on it but this has a couple different aspects that are, that are different than the previous one on Wednesday, September 12th, there was witnessed in the city the imposing and curious ceremony of the consecration of the Jewish synagogue. We refer, of course, to the opening of Sherath Israel, or Gates of Israel, which is absolutely not the right translation of Sherath Israel. Sherath Israel means remnant of Israel, but they are translated. Someone must have told the author, or the author, maybe he knew a little Hebrew and didn't get the name right, 
you know, that would be uh, Sha'are Yisrael, would be the gates of Israel. But this is Sha'irit Yisrael, which is the remnant of Israel. Different word. Anyway, a new and very prominent building on West 19th Street, one door west of Fifth Avenue. The day in question was chosen as being the 260th anniversary. That is not accurate either. 200 and uh, 206 is more accurate, 1654 to 1860, of the landing of the first Jewish settlers in this country. Okay, uh, let's go here. The new building cost more than $100,000. At 5 o'clock... Um, there were present many Christian clergy and laymen. The doors closed, and the service began with a curious and interesting ceremony. Four members of the congregation held up crimson drapery near the door, from which a knocking was heard. This was the rabbi, Reverend Jacques Judah Lyons, demanding entrance. The oldest Hebrew now alive in New York, Mr. Nathaniel Phillips, that's actually should say Naftali Phillips, 87 years of age, opened the door while the congregation sang, open to me the gates of righteousness. To this, the minister responded and was again answered by the choir. So there's a little back and forth of the ceremony. Um, by the way, in um, Amsterdam to this day, before entering the synagogue in the morning, they knock on the door three times. One, two, three. So uh, here, that's that's part of this initiation ceremony, this consecration ceremony. Um, the lamp was lighted, and the minister sang, and the choir responded, after which the procession walked around the synagogue seven times. So they took the Torah, they had hakafot, seven hakafot, um, and then they put the Sifrei Torah into the ark. After the scrolls were deposited in the ark, a discourse was delivered by Reverend Dr. Official, in which he traced the history of the Jews and, uh, and the decline of the great nations which had oppressed them. Um, a prayer for the government was followed by Reverend Mr. Lyons delivered, uh, and Reverend Mr. Lyons delivered an excellent conservative prayer in English. So there were multiple speakers. Uh, a little before seven, the service is concluded with the singing of Hallelujah. The singing of the choir, 18 voices in all, was very fine and much admired by judges of sacred music. It included several members of the Italian opera and among the best voices are those of the Nelson sisters. I didn't Google the Nelson sisters, but maybe we can find out more about them. The instrumental part consisted of 18 performers. So they had a band and they had a choir, quite a large uh, group of each. The music was composed and admirably conducted by Mr. D. Miranda. Also requires uh, some research, which I didn't do for today. But the interesting thing here is that in uh, this description, they emphasize how beautiful the music was. In the Occident, which is the newspaper published by um, Isaac Leeser in Philadelphia, there is a similar description. And after the description of the ceremony, there is an editorial by an anonymous author named Q, who uh, complains about the music. Why were they singing non-traditional songs composed for the benefit of the Gentile observers and not the traditional music of the congregation. So from, and that was published right in September of 1860. So right from the get-go, there is controversy about the music that the choir is singing before there is even a choir. <laughs> they're, they're arguing about it. But okay, that is the, um, the, uh, the dedication ceremony. And one last bit before we get it to the see some more pictures is um, the description of the building itself. The new building in 19th Street is the of Palladian style architecture, which is a classic architecture, classic uh, Roman architecture, blending of Ionic and Corinthian subdivisions of the Greek style, and is surmounted by a dome. The facing material is of Nova Scotia stone. Through the doorway, the visitor passes to a small and then a large vestibule on the ground floor, ornamented by Corinthian columns, deep bayed ceiling. Around are numerous doors, and before the doors leading to an and, and doors leading to an open space, um, 
without, uh, meaning outside, covered by an arbor hung with an awning for the feasts of the tabernacle. So if you go through the bottom of the synagogue, you get to a, 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 an outside space, and there they have the sukkah. To the left are four staircases, two for the males and two for the females. The sex is being separated in the Hebrew as well as in the Quaker devotions. Didn't know that Quakers had set proceeding too. The seats in the church are arranged from to the right and to the left, leaving open space for the desk, the ark, and a stage and movable pulpit for the preacher. So there are no pews in the center. We should take note of that. The ark itself is surrounded by Rosso Antico marble columns with gilded capitals and is richly paneled with rosewood and otherwise adorned. So it's a beautiful heichal. Its interior is covered with gold and crimson drapery. Inside the heichal itself, there is gold and crimson fabric and curtains fourteen uh, and contains 14 scrolls. There are 14 Torah scrolls. The interior of the building is decorated while the windows are filled with richly stained glass. From the paneled ceiling rise an octagonal dome with paneled sides, the opening at the top being filled with glasses like that of the other windows. It is said that the Ark of this synagogue is the best in the world. The one which next approaches it in beauty is the celebrated one in the synagogue of Livorno. Taken altogether, the synagogue is one of the first seats of worship of the people in the world, and decidedly one of the prominent lions and curiosities of New York. The name of its architect is Robert Mook, Esquire. So um, I really wanted to get to that last quote. So here is Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper, which is widely read because it had lots of pictures for people to look at. And uh, it describes it as one of the most prominent, most beautiful buildings in all of New York uh, at its opening in 1860. And I see that there is a chat. Let's take a look what we have here. No pews in the center answers your observation of the inaugural picture. Yes, but I'm telling you for another reason, because you're going to get some pictures later that I want you to take note of the center of the synagogue for. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Claude. Okay. Now, you ready to see some pictures? Let's take a look at some pictures. I think you've waited long enough. Okay, here is a picture on the left of the 19th Street Synagogue by Robert Mook. And it is said in some of the articles that it was designed in a Palladian style, um, which is a, you know, kind of a classic uh, revivalist style, a Baroque revival style in New York City. But here is actually what it was based on, or at least in some fashion, the Church of Santa Susana in Rome, which was built in, I think, like 1609 or 1509, I forget exactly, by Carlo Maderno. So uh, maybe it'd be called Maderno style, not Palladian style. But uh, you can see the similarities. Uh, and they're not perfect, but you have these double columns and this uh, kind of centered, very tall um, uh, image with multiple capitals being supported by columns on, on top of each other. So that is where he was getting the idea from. Um, one of the more famous buildings in Rome. Um, the architect, Mook, was pretty famous in his own right. And he has several buildings which are excellent today or are well known, and including many buildings that are less well known. So he was very, very prominent in New York at the time. Here on the left is the parish house of the Church of Incarnation, Madison Avenue and... 35th Street, you can see it today. This was designed by Robert Mook uh, and built in 1868. Here is a, a very interesting building called Ward Castle in Rye Brook, built in 1872. The engineer's name was Ward, hence the name Ward Castle, and the architect was Mook, our architect. And the interesting about, thing about this building, which was built 12 years later, is that it's all uh, concrete. So this is, you know... Uh, Reinforced concrete, that was not a thing until Mook made it one in 1872. And then here is a very famous and large mansion or set of mansions. There was a whole set of buildings that were built by Mary Mason Jones on Fifth Avenue and 57th Street, built 
1868 by Robert Mook, so that she and her friends could have uh, grand places to live. They were demolished much later on, but this is a extant picture of it. Um, and so you get a little sense that he was a very well-known uh, architect in his day. Uh, here is another picture of the facade. You can get a sense of the height. You know, someone's walking in here. There is a lot of height to the synagogue. Next to it, which I didn't mention yet, uh, is the was not extant in 1860, but about uh, five years later or so, they built the uh, parsonage for the for Reverend Lyons to live in, uh, and that was this building right here. Um, I'm just thinking of what else you can see. There's a little open space here. None of this exists anymore. This building does still exist, and we'll see a picture of it later. The dome effect. Why wasn't okay? So, um, thank you, Annette. So the the seating capacity was actually pretty close. So the the this synagogue was eight, seated eight hundred, um, at least in eighteen sixty, and then a little later it started seated more. Um, our synagogue seats seven hundred. Uh, so I guess our synagogue is a little smaller than that one was. Um, but the dome was a source of problems. The dome leaked. So uh, every couple of years, they spend a lot of money repairing the dome. Uh, also, at some point uh, in the history of the short history of the synagogue, um, there was a snow uh, drift, you know, after a large snow, there was a lot of snow up here, fell down and damaged the, the neighboring building. And the synagogue had to pay a lot of money for that repair. Um, and so the dome idea, I think, was abandoned later on. There is an article by Brunner. Um, Brunner was also trying to merge the style of this grand synagogue with the style of the Crosby Street Synagogue and his own conceptions of what neoclassical architecture should be like when he made our current building. Um, hope that answers some of your questions. So here's one of the rooms that you came in, in from the main floor. So when you came in, you actually didn't come in to see the big synagogue. You came in and one of the rooms contained this which we might call the little synagogue because it contained much of the furniture that we still use in what we now call the little synagogue here on 70th street. And this is furniture that came from the earlier buildings from Crosby street, from mill street, uh, including the 10 commandments here, the Teba, the banister, the candlesticks and these benches, which in this room are in front of the Teba, something we would never do, but I guess uh, they needed rooms needed space. They had to put them. Oh, and the bancas. The bancas we still use as well. What's different uh, about this little synagogue from what we have today? Um, this drawer, we do not have this drawer. And our, uh, currently in the on the uh, on the teba, it's just the table itself. This drawer doesn't exist. And if you take a look up here uh, with these vases, there is a second kind of vase which we do not have anymore. So can't really get very good close look at it, but uh, that's some of the differences um, as well. Also, the Heichal itself uh, is uh, different. We don't have this today. We don't have this whole, I don't know, bottom support uh, that is indicated here. Uh, okay. So, the, But this is what was in the 19th Street Synagogue. Now we're looking at, the, the order of these pictures is not not perfect, but now we are looking at the front of the synagogue uh, in 19th Street to try to get a sense of uh, the Heichal itself. Um, I don't have a, later pictures, you'll get a sense of scale. But here, by the way, is the pulpit. This is the pulpit which the Chazan, Reverend Lyons, or the preacher, or the lecturer, Dr. Fischel, would ascend using these stairs. They call it a movable um pulpit but i don't think this is at all movable but maybe because it wasn't part of the original architecture i, I don't know why it would be called movable at all but uh it's ascended by this stairwell and supported over here uh and so i guess the, the the instead of having a pulpit on the same level it gets to be a little higher up so it can be heard by the by the uh women's gallery you can also see uh, the um the canopy is really one of the unique features here that we don't have at all anymore a whole canopy coming out um covering the area of the teba of the hechal and the hechal has two levels like we have today it has fewer sifrei torah than we do today 
but same idea, two levels of uh, sefarim. And here is the uh, ner tamid, the perpetual lamp. Now, I don't know if I put it in here, but I'm going to share with you another picture of the perpetual lamp uh, as it exists today uh, in our synagogue. Oh, first I'll... Uh, I don't have it for you. Okay. Anyway, if you go to the um, small synagogue today, we use that Ner Tamid that was hanging in 19th Street as one of the memorial lamps. Uh, and uh, so you can see it up close and personal. Uh, it is brass. It was described in the uh, in the Frank Leslie's um, uh, illustrated as being made of silver. It is not made of silver. It's made of brass. Um, but it is uh, essentially the same. One of the interesting features of it is that it's the only place in the whole synagogue today that has uh, Magin David, has the stars of David all around it. Um, I guess that was a feature of it, which would have been interesting in 1860. I don't know if they're original or not. I have I tend to think not, because 1860 would have been very, very early for the use of the Magin David icon in the synagogue, but um, but possible. Uh, anyway, that's uh, we'll take a look at that if I can at the end. If you have a few moments to stay, I'll try to find a better picture of the Nair Tamid as it is today in the little synagogue. Okay, going back to the slideshow. Okay. Well, these are very rare pictures. People don't don't see these pictures much. Um, they're not published anywhere, as I can tell. Um, really interesting is uh, as this this canopy up here, as well as this uh, the, the pulpit. And now here is the front of the synagogue. So first of all, you can get a sense of the height. Um, this is the main level. And what do you see? Pews. Pews behind, pews in front. Those were added later. Um, Dr. Poole describes how there was a need for more seating. And so they added, first they added these pews. And then they still needed more a couple of years later. So they added these pews in front. But that is why in the original picture and the original descriptions, this is all an open area. But later on, as the synagogue uh, got more and more full, uh, they needed more seating and added pews where they could, which was right here in the center. Here is a good look at the base of this pulpit, as well as some of the lamps that are uh, gas lamps that are in front of the steps to the Hechal, as well as the Teba itself. Uh, I don't. I didn't count them. I don't think there are twelve like we have today. One, two, three, four, five, six. Maybe there are twelve. I don't know. Um, but there. This is a, a more narrow and wide, um, or I should say, more shorter and wider teba than we have today, uh, with a very wide table. This table is very, very wide itself. So the teba itself is quite large. Uh, very interesting thing that we that I always thought was something so classy that we don't have a clock in our synagogue. But sure enough, in 1860, they had a clock right in the back of the synagogue, so you could knew exactly uh, if they were late or if the services were running long or if the rabbi's talk was going a bit long. You could take a look at the at the clock in the back of the synagogue. Okay, um, and you just just to get a sense of how high the women's gallery is pretty high up. And then it goes up even further. There's, I, I wish there was a picture showing the interior of the dome, but there isn't. So you can just get a sense of how high this building was. Um, and here's another, another image of the pulpit itself, which does have a humash on it, <laughs> even in 1860. And I tried to get a little more detail of the uh, Nair Tamid, but uh, I don't think it comes out so well. Now here's another another picture showing the really the grand height. Here is the just the the base of the uh, where the dome begins. It's octagonal, remember? So there's uh, panels of it. Oops, let me go back one. Uh, let's try to move this out of the way. So you can just see in here somehow, which I don't have an image of, are 
lamps are gas lamp gas lamps which uh, illuminate the building at night illuminate the room at night during the day you have a lot of natural light coming in from these windows as can be seen from this very photograph and here is the second level of um of a second ladies gallery uh which they originally had intended for uh perhaps for a choir although they didn't have a choir in 1860 so i guess it was intended as a second um ladies gallery um but apparently when they added pews here they took them from here so i'm not 100 percent sure how that what was the, what the purpose of this gallery was was it additional seating or some other purpose much like we have a additional gallery that we don't make use of much except for storage today um you can see here that the much like today which is really surprising they had stained glass which had geometric designs no images no no trees no mountains no harsini no 12 tribes just these um geometric designs uh and you can really get a sense that this is a tremendously tall building tremendously tall building um even taller than what we have today and that is the back of it and here is the front <laughs> now a couple things i want to show you so here's here's the three or four steps come up by the way in this photograph they have placed the silver here for some reason so you can see the bells not enough detail to really see what they are but the silver is here there's additional silver here I don't know what this is. I think this might be the bowl for washing the Kohanim, uh, the silver basin and laver, but I can't can't really tell uh, from the, the detail isn't there. But I, what I want you to get a sense of is the height. So here you come up the steps, you stand here. This is probably already three or four feet high. The Nair Tamid is here. So maybe this is even more. Maybe this is like six or seven feet high. I don't know. If, if this is the Nair Tamid, I don't really know exactly how high this has to be because then you get a canopy. Then you get the Ten Commandments. And these are the very same Ten Commandments that we have today. Then on top of that, you get Dalef Nehmi Atao made and then a capital. And then it goes up even further with windows and, and, and further and further up. So the, I just, the sense of height is something unbelievable in this synagogue. Look how these lamps are hanging down. How high they must be hanging from is, is really quite incredible these uh these gas lamps here um which are illuminating the men's section this is the women's section and the roof is way 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 up high and here are the bankas which you might notice are in their own for the parnas and the sagan they're in their own little uh, enclosure these are separated uh from the rest of the congregation the the parnas doesn't mingle in the pews he has his own special pew right here um, there's probably other things to note, but, uh, that's, uh, that's what I can get for you at, at this time. Uh, here's another angle of it. This, this time they didn't have the silver hanging, hanging out below. Uh, but you get, this is from the ladies gallery. I guess you get a little different of an angle, different angle here. You can get a sense of the, the windows above the hechal. And this is, again, this is like a red marble here, a gilt with gilted, uh, uh, capitals of the columns and finally here is a picture of the 19th Street synagogue and the parsonage this is where by the way Jacques Suda Lyons died in 1877 and where Henry Perimendi's moved into the synagogue is gone but the parsonage is still there and uh, I think if I even saw recently that it's for rent so you could actually rent this entire building uh, if you wanted to live in the parsonage of the 19th Street synagogue uh, and do what with it there? I don't know, but it's still it's still there, pretty much as it looked when it was built in a, I think 1865 or so. So that is my uh, presentation for you this evening. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you get a, a sense of the uh, Night Two Synagogue, which we are commemorating this Shabbat. And so I'm gonna end the uh, recording, and I'm gonna let everybody talk to each other. Uh, I will not be seeing you before Rosh Hashanah. So a part of me feels I uh, should blow shofar for you, but we've done that already. So uh, another time we'll uh, we'll talk about the Silichot, maybe before Kippur, uh, or something else from Kippur. But I want to wish you all Tizkul Hashanim Abod many years, and you should have a happy and a healthy year and holiday. So let me uh, let me just let you everyone, let me end, them, end the uh, recording here.
I thought uh, Shabbat HaGadol is commemorated. Shabbat HaGadol is the commemoration for the uh, second Mill Street Synagogue of 1818. You got to keep track. Oh. Of you got to, you got to, you know, falling behind. <laughs> <laughs> um, 